So hi everyone, my name is Joan Neely McCarthy and I am executive director here at the Summit School. There are some familiar faces that I see um, and I am happy to see everyone here. Thanks for spending your Tuesday evening with me tonight. So um, I just want a quick look. Um, Oh, Nicole, you want to brag about our amazing middle school faculty. Thank you. All right. So um, I am going to share my screen, hopefully, and um, and just to have this conversation about middle school. Um, some parents that are here are parents of our students here at the Summit School, and, and some parents are, are outside of our community, but a middle schooler is a middle schooler, and the great expectation grade level expectations are the grade level expectations. So um, with that, I'm going to put up what I have. Oops, no, I didn't want to do that. This is what I wanted to do. There you go. Okay, so, um, you know, it's just a few of us, so we can certainly, um, certainly, you know, just kind of raise your hand. I can't see the pictures, but Jess can and Nicole can. So feel free to just ask questions and pause me as I go along. This is really kind of a stepping stone for a conversation anyway. So um, we hear this, we do um, talks with our parents, like our sixth grade parents, and, and in the beginning of seventh grade parent, um, we have a talk with our parents because they're all worried it's seventh grade, and then we have eighth grade, and, and then it's high school. So I, all the parents say in seventh grade, he seems so immature, and I use he just for consistency's sake. It's also she. Um, how will he ever be ready for middle school? And and um, Nicole and I kind of chuckle and we say, uh, go sit in a middle school class and then ask about maturity. So sometimes it's it's pretty funny in those classes, wouldn't you say, Nicole? They are definitely works in progress. <laughs> uh, Nicole has this um, this theory about foot size and boys. W yep. Would you care to share that? So for anyone who has a boy, when his feet start to grow, his brain will go right out the window. Um, and that's, that's my theory. I stick to it. Um, using not just all students that I've worked with throughout my life as an educator, middle school life as an educator, um, but my own son, um, his feet would grow and he would regress. Um, and he he couldn't think it was um, startling and a little bit scary at times but every time his feet would grow his brain went right out the window <laughs> oh that's pretty funny we always say uh, sixth grade the kids kind of get ramped up to be to be awful because seventh grade is definitely the worst yeah and, and then something happens this summer um, after seventh grade, we call it eighth grade magic. And these kids come back, um, you like them and, and they're tolerant and and they're fun to be with. Uh, it's a whole different ball game. But, and, and we tell parents all the time, it's okay, you, you can get through this, it, it'll be okay. So, you know, typically um, when parents are thinking about middle school. They're looking at these sweet little elementary schools that their kids have been in, and all of a sudden they're looking at a building that houses anywhere from 1,000 to 3,000 kids. And, and they know, oh my goodness, how is my child gonna do this? How is my child gonna cope with all these teachers? Oh my goodness, lockers and locks. Um, and will he lunch in the cafeteria? What if he doesn't make the sports team? All of those things, all of the things that you're thinking, you reflect back to when you were in middle school. And guess what? The things that are that's that are in your head are, are pretty much in your child's head too. But but you can't let on. You only you only let them know that you are confident that their experience is gonna be is just gonna be spectacular. So we wonder how these kids will manage. And, and then we say, well, well, who invented middle school anyway? And oh, by the way, who invented seventh graders? Because they definitely are um, 
I wouldn't say the superstars, but just, um, you know, they, they are entertaining on a, on a good day. So, so since um, I, I, we wanted to talk about development, I thought that at the, at the onset, just broad strokes for children who um, are on the typical academic trajectory, here are the things that, that we look for when a child is ready to enter sixth grade. I'm not talking about kids with dyslexia. I'm not talking about kids necessarily who have learning differences, but I'm talking about the typical sixth grader. So typically we want them to read at a sixth grade level for both literature and, and just text, science and social studies. We want them to be able to read aloud fluently, which means at a good rate without errors. Um, they should be able to comprehend grade level text and respond to literal and inferential questions orally and in writing in complete sentences unassisted. Um, we want them to be able to use background knowledge to make connections about what they're learning and to start to show some insight and some novel thought. We want them to be able to write at least one paragraph with a clear beginning and ending, but really they should be able to do a three paragraph essay and they should be able to spell reasonably well. I'm going to call upon Nicole um, Easton again for this, um, having been um, in a middle school, um, a typical middle school for many years. Um, is there anything you want to add to that or, or, or adjust, Nicole? Um no, that sounds pretty good. I think, you know, at, at this stage, also as they're entering in, they have some idea of who they are as learners. Um, and um, they they have some idea of how they think they may want to manage themselves, um, but not really for sure yet, but kind of have some ideas. So Yeah, they're, they're getting to that. Yeah. So with math, um, once again, this is broad strokes. Math fact automaticity is really important um, so that they can do math quickly and, and, and effectively. They should at the very least be able to respond to two-step math problems with irrelevant information. They should be able to use the algorithms and equations that are part of the curriculum. They should be able to think algebraically and start to use algebraic expressions and long division, fractions, and decimals. And why do I say call them out? Because typically when kids struggle in math, um, long division is a bear, fractions can be a total enigma, and fractions and decimals are integrally related. And, and they should know that by the time they get into sixth grade. Um, and if they haven't, you have to figure out, is it because of poor instruction or is it because of other reasons, but these are these are the building blocks that they need for math. Um, a big part of doing school is executive functions, and so for for all on the call, I'm gonna just I'll show you some executive function slides. And basically, that's your ability to to work through your day. It's planning, it's emotional control, it's regulating your emotions, it's regulating um, your activity, what you have to do, um, and and that plays a big part in kids adjusting to middle school, um, as well as oral language. So children should be able to work independently. And, and they shouldn't have to rely on an adult to kind of say, did you do this? Did you do this? Where's this? Where's that? Um, did you do your homework? Um, they should be able to do their homework independently. They should be able to work well within a group on a project. Um, long-term projects, now let's, let's give us some grace here, not major long-term projects. If they're gonna have a long-term project, it really needs a very clear rubric, not too long with explicit expectations and explicit deadlines, and that teacher still needs to check in. But, but a child going into sixth grade should not freak out when given a long-term project with those kinds of supports. Um, they should be able to converse easily with adults and peers. They should be able to understand double entendre. So at this point in time, kids understand puns, they understand jokes, it's a rapid repartee back and forth, and they should be able to understand sarcasm and they should be able to understand when, when um, when conversations are are digs as you give as good as you get, so that there's there's just good natured teasing going back and forth, and they should have perspective taking. So they should be able to understand um, somebody else's perspective, what somebody else is going through, or why somebody else has an opinion, um, and they should be able to do that socially and and with their humanities. They should be able to do that when they're studying. Um, so social studies, and they should even be able to, to understand alternatives, alternative hypotheses and thoughts in science. 
Anything else, Nicole, that, that you might want to add to that? Um, no, I think that sounds pretty good. Okay. Just jump in anytime, Nicole. I'm forgetting. Okay. Okay. So just let's back you up. So given those things, okay, given those broad strokes, let's just back you up. You got this. So we're going to talk a little bit about typical development. We're going to talk about some academic expectations and challenges, some social expectations and challenges, and some parent-child communication. So middle school equals adolescence, and it's a time of transition and change. That is so turbulent for kids because it, they don't understand all the changes that are going on cognitively, hormonally, socially. It, it is a big deal for kids. And, and walking from a sweet little classroom of 20, 25, maybe even 30 kids, but it's one teacher or maybe two teachers to this huge building where there's five or six or seven teachers and throngs of kids in a hallway finding a classroom, oh, and oh yeah, you have to make friends again, and oh yeah, what's going on in the cafeteria? It's huge for kids. Um, and, and usually, you know, middle school, sixth grade is, is, is the right time for it to happen. Fifth grade is too young, um, but sixth grade is good, and most kids are able to make that transition in about a month's time. So that first month of sixth grade is tough, um, but most kids by about October-ish kind of have it figured out at the level that they're supposed to have it figured out. Um, schools are, are, if, are, if nothing, but developmentally appropriate. Sixth grade has appropriate standards. They know where sixth grade cognition is. And then the, the, the expectations get ramped up for seventh grade and then again for eighth grade. Um, but, but a rule of thumb is children should be able to, to figure out get their, their um, duck feet, you know, by about October in middle school. And it's a time of cognitive growth and social emotional development, hormonal changes, and growth spurts, in, in, including feet, as Nicole said. <laughs> yeah, definitely the feet. So um, cognitive growth, and I included 12 to 18. And, and for some children, it really starts in sixth grade. And I know that you see this in some of our sixth graders, uh, Nicole. So they, they can start to engage in abstract thinking. They can think about the possibilities. They're not in the here and now anymore. They're, they're thinking about alternatives. Um, and they kind of like engaging in that conversation. They, they know... Um, that, that they can form new ideas or questions from known principles or known facts. And they can start to consider many points of view and they can compare and debate ideas or opinions. It's at this point in time when kids really kind of feel grown up when they have conversations with their teachers about, about um, events going on in the world, about what's going on in the news. Um, and, and they start to form their own opinions about how they think and what they think and, and how they think and what they think might not be what the teacher thinks, which is appropriate, and may not be what parents think or what their siblings think or what their grandparents think because they're starting to, to form those ideas based upon what they know. Um, and, and up to this point, you know, according to standards, the state standards and how we look at ELA and how we look at social studies and science, we really work to get children to this point where they start to think about possibilities. They start to think about thinking and think about what are alternative outcomes, what are alternative ways of doing things. So everything that happens in elementary school leads them to a nice transition into complex thinking. When children are um, very rigid and very black and white in sixth grade, it's a it's problem for them because the, the expectation from the teachers and from their peers and from the curriculum requires them to engage in abstract thinking. Mm -hmm. So the children that are more black and white that haven't reached that point yet really struggle with sixth grade academics and sixth grade social, um, social events or, or social parameters. So, oops. So I just got a call. Um, cognitive growth in adolescence, each child moves ahead at their own rate in their ability to think in more complex ways. So 
think back as, as, as a mom with a young child, you know, you look at your baby, you say, okay, seven months, they start to crawl. And all of a sudden they're up on all fours around eight, nine months. They got that babbling around between 12 and 16 months. They start to say words, you know, there are certain things that, that you can say, here's, here's how old this baby is. Here's how old this toddler is. And this is what I, I expect. Cognitive growth. When we get to that sixth, seventh grade level, it's a little more flexible. Um, sometimes you'll see this cognitive growth in very mature and very advanced 10 year olds, but sometimes it just won't happen till 12 or 13. So, so, so you just have to kind of gauge where your child is and just know that, that it is a journey and they do get there by eighth grade. And then, and, and, and also I want to project ahead of time and, and, and kind of make you smile, but eighth grade is not the end all and the be all. The next major component. The next, next major milestone is like 16, 17, junior in high school. And if your child is still plucking your every last nerve when they're a junior in high school, the end game is age 25. I promise you. <laughs> At age 25, they're going to say to you, mom, you were right. You were right not to give me that Mustang when I was 16. You were right in telling me I had to study this way. You were right, mom. Thanks for sending me to that school. It takes, sometimes it takes a, a long time, but, but it happens. But nevertheless, cognitive growth really is uh, has a, has a wider margin in in adolescence it also depends upon their exposure to um experience, experimental thinking, to in, engaging them in, in making, um, setting opinions, setting goals. Um, so it really depends upon their earlier experiences as to how soon you're going to see that cognitive growth. Um, and each kid de develops in their own view of the world. You talk to even a 10 year old, some 10 year olds are pretty, pretty set in what they, how they see the world. And certainly by the time a child gets to seventh grade, they should be able to kind of give you opinions based upon some facts or based upon their experiences. Um, some children may be able to use logical operations in schoolwork long before they can use them for personal problems. So you'll say, how can you think and reason with that math problem, but you can't find your way out of a paper bag when I'm asking you to work something out with your sibling. Um, so, but, but because it, it, there's a difference between something that's outside of self, which is a school problem, versus something that's within self. When emotional issues come up, they c it can sometimes cause problems because sometimes if something comes up, an emotional something, a conflict, um, sometimes they might read way too much into it and go off the deep end and have a meltdown. Um, or sometimes they can say, eh, it's not that big a deal, I'm, I'm going to move on. But it just depends on the child and the issue and, and which nerve it plucks uh, for them. Um, the ability to consider possibilities may affect decision making. Sometimes, I mean, we all do. We kind of get stuck in the mud. We say, here's the problem. If I do this, this is going to happen. If I do this, this is going to happen. If I do that. And, and so sometimes you, you become inert because you just don't know. You don't know which one to pick because which one is the best one. Or you look at all your alternatives and you say, they're all not so great. So, so which one is it going to be? Um, but for the most part, when child are able to engage in looking at the possibilities, there's usually a positive, um, a positive ending or a positive outcome. So when we look at cognitive growth in adolescence, like I said, they can use more complex thinking um, and they start to use that complex thinking focused on personal decision making. So they start to look at Harry's doing something that's going to get him in big trouble with his parents. I don't think I'm going to do it. I can remember sitting on the front steps um, at my house when I was, I was a little older. I must have been about 14 or 15. The bathroom window was open and my mother was cleaning the bathroom and my girlfriend came over to visit me and was talking about how they were pool hopping in her neighborhood um, in, in their pajamas. Um, and and um, I remember saying to her, sounds like a lot of fun, but I'll tell you the truth. If I ever did that, and my mother caught me, I would be toast. Sure enough, later on, when I went in the house, I heard all about it from my mother, but I was able to engage in thinking about probably not the safest thing to do um, in general and definitely not the safest thing to do in my house. Um, they begin to show some use of formal logical operations in schoolwork. They begin to question authority and society standards. Sixth grade, I can't tell you how many moms say to me, they're lippy, they're not pleasant, 
right now I love them, but I don't really like them. And my response is, and that's a good thing. And they're supposed to question authority. They're supposed to look at society standards because what you don't want is you don't want your child to just be a complacent follower. You want them to be able to think on their feet and have the, the conviction of, 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 um, of their own opinions and their ability to, to run their own life as opposed to being uh, having their life run by somebody else, by a peer. And, and, and those actions of the peers might not be what fits in with your family or might not be safe or healthy. This, that's so, the, that's the, the space in development, I feel like, where you hear more about eye rolling than, <laughs> yeah. than the harumph. You get yeah. the eye roll and the harumph more than ever is in the probably the third month of the sixth grade and it will take us almost all the way to the beginning of seventh grade um, and they they start to get a handle on it and start to realize that they can get their ideas and their thoughts across um, and share their um, their dissatisfaction with the adult in the room without eye rolling um, or or harumphing. So that's that's my favorite. I do want to tell you that when you talk to sixth and seventh grade teachers, that is the thing that annoys them and upsets them the most. The thing that they have to remember, this is just normal. I just have to not pay attention to it, right? It, it just, it, it, you know, you know, as a parent. Um, so, um, so anyway, so, so yeah, um, they begin to form and speak their own thoughts, views. They like a sports team. They, they like certain kinds of styles. Um, and, and they'll tell you what rules should be changed. So, um, <laughs> so we, I have this uh, little seventh grade, little seventh grader. He's a seventh grader, nice young man. Um, but he feels, um, quite compelled and, and, and quite free to email me um, when he thinks a decision that has been made is just not the right decision. And usually those decisions revolve around virtual learning on a snow day. So um, so I have had a couple of uh, disgruntled emails from him um, because we have had some snow days where we said, it's really not that snowy and it's just yucky out there. Y you can do virtual school instead of calling a snow day. So I, I just get a, a charge out of the fact that he just feels that it's important for him to, to let me know that he's just not a happy camper. Um, and and, and I, I do say answer him very nicely and I say, thank you for this email. I love that you're emailing me. So, um, but, it, but it's pretty funny. I chuckle every time it comes up. Um, emotional development, it is turbulent. Um, even, you know, like even little girls might start in fifth grade as their hormones start to change. But teen hormones affect their moods, their emotions, and their impulses, as well as their physical development. And it's the, 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 the fluctuations, the mood swings um, that is um, partially driven by estrogen and progesterone um, and testosterone and also from dopamine and some other neurotransmitters. But those sex hormones um, really kind of make them crazy. Um, mm -hmm. And go ahead, go ahead, Nicole, because you, you, you're well, no, really and, and And what I love about this time for them um, is that they they don't know why this is happening. And so when they're crazy and they're off the hook and they're being hormonal and um, it's 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 fun to see them kind of toggle between I got this and I'm grown up and I can handle this. And then seconds later, literally breaking down and, you know, don't understand what's happening. And I don't, you know, why am I being this way? And I really like that friend. And I can't believe I said that. And so it's nice because it leaves them for me anyway, in a vulnerable space where you can coach them through what's happening. Um, and, and, you know, they start to understand, one, that the adults in the room usually are on their side, and two, that it's okay to not understand your feelings all the time, um, and that their feelings will impact their their um, academics, um, but that there's people around, there's adults in the room that have been through it, and that's where you start to see them kind of hook on to the possibility of what's to come and kind of help propel them through that really mixed up seventh grade piece into that eighth grade space. 
So I, it's, yeah, yeah. I love when they're nutty. You know, I, I mean, I, I don't personally, like I, I expect like sixth grade, they're gonna say, well, who's going out or ask somebody out where they're going. Of course, we as adults don't know, but but it, it's it's reaching down earlier and earlier. So, I mean, it, it goes on in fourth grade and fifth grade and it drives me personally crazy because I just have, you just have to be friends. You don't have to worry about that. You just have to be friends right now. But kids are very, very aware. Um, and as you know, depending upon their, um, their hormone maturity, um, they kind of figure it out earlier than others. And, and, and the thing is, usually we know this, girls usually figure it out quicker than boys. And, and boys are just, they, they just can't win because girls just wrap them around their fingers right from the get-go. Would, would you agree, Nicole? Yeah. And they don't, I, it's funny that you say that. I actually had a conversation with one of my seventh graders today and um, he, he was upset because, well, she texted me and said that, she needed space and then i turned around and she was coming into the room and so i had to have a conversation with him i was like okay so when a girl says she wants space that means she doesn't want to talk to you when a boy says he needs space that means he doesn't want to be in the room with you and he said well, how am I supposed to know that? Where, where is it that girls do this? And, and I was like, oh, you'll know. I said, but let me let me be really clear with you, buddy. You're never going to understand them. So stop trying. Stick with the fellas. Stick with the fellas and stop trying to understand the girls. It's never going to happen. And he, he he was like, he had to sit down. He said, I'm going to take a minute and then I'll go back to class. <laughs> I think I know who that is. <laughs> it was brilliant. <laughs> I love that. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think I'm going to take a minute. I'm I like, love right, that. You're good. That's mm -hmm. terrific. I live for the moment. So, so to reiterate, um, moods and feelings are a part of this middle school experience. Um, intense emotions. Girls get dramatic. They're just, you're just going to ruin their life if you don't let them buy something or right. if you don't let them go or or whatever whatever their du jour is you're just going to ruin their life um and sometimes you know the meltdowns are huge like out of the blue when you look and you say mm -hmm. what's yeah. up right you, you just don't know they're very sensitive to others um they'll get better at reading and understanding other people's emotions but while they're developing their skills, they can misread facial express expressions and body language and take everything personally. So it, 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 while they're getting sensitive to other people, still within themselves, they just take on, they're very sensitive. They just take it on and, and, and feel bad about things that they shouldn't. Um, and this is where, off, this is, sorry, I don't mean to jump in on you, but this no, is where I, I also feel in that same space of becoming sensitive to others and trying to figure out how all of those emotions work for everybody else. This is where I feel like um, I see the the girls more than the boys. They figure out or they start to try to figure out how much power their their own emotions have. And then they start to practice things like how I can hold you emotionally hostage and what can I say that might get your attention but won't hurt your feelings. When I say this like that, is that going to hurt you? So they... This is where I feel like seventh grade girls are just not nice people because um, they have enough language skill usually and they're trying to figure out the that emotional piece of it. And they understand, like Joan was just saying, they, they start to understand that their emotions really have power and they try to figure out how to work them, right? What can I do and how can I say? And, you know, so this is the one where, you know, the friend is mad at the other friend and the friend says, I really want to talk to her. And she says, no, I don't want to talk to you. And so nothing gets worked out because the one friend doesn't really not want to talk, but she's dragging it out to see how long she can hold her emotionally hostage to keep the other friend spinning. Um, and then they eventually it blows up and they work it out and it's fine and whatever. But this is the practice phase where... Um, where they're gonna try to figure out which skills are are useful ones and which ones are not. And so this is where you see that. 
And what doesn't work with these? It's a dance, and and as the adults in the in, in the in the, the this this scenario, you have to figure it out. But getting in the weeds with all of these, you know, momentary adolescent dramas is just not okay. They yeah. tend to work it out on their own, unless there's something really mean or really um, right. mean spirited or ugly or horrible. But um, but adults can't jump in and start to micromanage and, and do the negotiation. The kids kind of have to learn it on their own. Yeah, they got to learn it themselves. So this is where we practice and we're getting better at using it in middle school. Is, the, is it true? Is it kind? Is it necessary? And if they can answer yes to all three of those questions, then by all means have at it. But if anywhere in there, is it true? Is it kind? Is it necessary? Any one of those is a no, then you need to keep that thought in your thought bubble, that action or that idea in your thought bubble and let it go. So, and it's yeah. practice. So it's it all about practice. practice. Sometimes I have to really think about what's going to stay in my thought bubble. I'm telling, I'm you. telling you. Right? Um, the next one is, is the kids are self-conscious. I mean, we're all self-conscious, but it's really awful in middle school. It gets a little bit better in high school and certainly gets better in college, one would hope. But I want to point out, and this is not a conversation about technology, that's a whole nother topic. But in this world of remote learning and learning on the grid, um, one of my pet peeves is of, when I'm in adult meetings um, is when people don't turn on their cameras. Um, because if we were sitting in the same room, we would be looking at each other. And so I feel it is um, it is just business courtesy to put your camera on. However, for kids, it's really hard because they're so self-conscious. Looking at themselves on the grid as they're looking at the other kids can be so overwhelming and anxiety producing that they just can't do it. We do have this rule that cameras need to be on. You can, we use, you know, Google Meet. You can put yourself in a little picture in the corner so you don't have to look at each other. But but we do look at this very carefully, case by case with each child. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Well, it, it's, it's exactly that. It's really hard because um, uh, initially when this kind of came up, my initial thought was, well, you're looking at everybody else, so, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that person is looking at you. And and you're right. What comes back in this setting is the narcissistic piece where then it's all about me. So instead of me really looking at you on the screen and picking your friend apart or looking at that person's shirt or looking how that person just answered the question, what it really comes down to is that whole 40 minute class where that student is in there, they are picking themselves apart and finding all the imperfections and my eyebrows are different heights and oh my gosh, I have a unibrow or oh, I think I'm getting a, a blemish. And so they really spend that time actually picking themselves apart. Um, some can't get past it. Others um, are, you know, mostly the boys are just like, oh, not a big deal, and they go on about their day. I think it's a little bit more challenging for the girls just because they seem to be more self-aware at this stage of their development. Um, some of our kids have struggled with it, so we will allow them to turn the camera off, but they must respond with their voice so we can at least hear how they're sounding um, and then throughout a course period just to you know kind of make sure we are checking in the right way with them is we'll give them a heads up like hey I'm going to need you guys to all turn a camera on for the this next activity I'm going to come at you in like three more minutes and then we're all going to turn cameras on we'll do it while we do this activity and then for those of you who are uncomfortable I'll let you turn it back off again but just to have that conversation and have that dialogue um, they find comforting because they get that we understand that for some is really hard. Um, and I think that's a lot of what all of this is, the social, emotional development, this space for them is having those conversations where you get it, you know, and, and sharing that, you know, I remember middle school and I remember how hard it was. Um, and you're going to get through this. Lots of laughs and giggles. Um, because you can't take any of it seriously, remembering that it was the hardest phase of development for all of us. Um, you know, I was talking to somebody the other day and they were like, actually, I think it was my kids. And they were like, okay, for a billion dollars, would you go back to seventh grade? And I was like, 
For a billion, yes. For a million, no. <laughs> so, you know, but I would only go back if I knew today, if I could keep the, the knowledge that I have today going back. But if I had to go back completely blind and do seventh grade as a seventh grader for a billion, yeah, no, it wouldn't mean a thing to me. Billion dollars wouldn't mean anything. So, no, you could keep it. <laughs> That's funny. So the other thing that we, you know, as the children grow and we see them as these young adults and, and then they just make dumb decisions or it seems like they're not even thinking at all. And, 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 and we look at them like, are you kidding me? Um, their brains aren't quite set up yet okay. to do those complex decision making um, with those complex decision making skills where they're thinking three, five, seven steps ahead. Um, so that that's part of their executive functioning. And so um, girls are a little bit better at this, I, I think, than boys are. But but still, sometimes you just say, wh why are you so impulsive? We've done this before. I've told you this before. It's just not within their, their yeah. brain development to make those really measured, advanced plan decisions. So the why questions usually don't get anybody any answers, just gets them frustrated. So the, you know, why'd you do that? Or, or why'd you think that would work out for you that way? Like that doesn't work. It's the what questions and the how questions. So if you can stay away from the why, because they have no idea why they just did what they did. No idea. Like help me understand would be a better way than just like, why yes. did you help me right. understand what your thinking was. Exactly. Um, save face too with that. Yeah. And then um, everybody gets a good giggle. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So this is, as I said, they're, they're forming their personal and social identity. Um, <laughs> they explore, they test limits, um, they become autonomous. They want to separate and individuate. They want to do it independently. They don't want you, you know, this is like the, the sitcoms where you, you have the adolescent tell their parent, drop me off two blocks away from school because I don't want you anywhere near school. Um, they, they just want this sense of self. Um, even kids who struggle in school, um, if they really haven't had any any um, tutoring or any insight into why they might struggle, when they get to middle school, the fact that you still need to help them is very upsetting. And they go, I got this. I can do it on my own. And, and you know that they're not ready because they don't have the skill set or they don't have the organization. But that, that sense of independence and, and wanting to be grown up is very, very strong. And, and sometimes it gets in the way when the child is doesn't have the skill set to be independent. Um, it is at this time where kids say, who am I and who do I want to be? And they start forming their value system and their value systems are based upon the value, the value systems in your family. So that's why it's always important from early on to talk about what your values are. I'm not telling you to be preachy, but what I'm saying is that there are family values that you hold dear and those should be topics of conversation. Be a good person, be kind, um, help others. Whatever it is in your family, you start that early the children listen and they take it, they use it and, and guide their life in that way. Um, early in adolescence, that the cognitive development lets them have greater self-awareness. Um, they can, like I said, think about abstract things, future possibilities. Um, there are changes in levels of certain neurotransmitters. Remember, we talked about the sex hormones, but there's also changes in neurotransmitters such as dopamine and serotonin. And this can influence the way in which children experience emotions. So um, if they don't have a whole lot of serotonin, it's really hard to calm. Just think about when you get really upset or nervous or anxious or whatever, um, you know, you might reach for that Twinkie because all of that sugar just sets out the serotonin, which is very calming. <laughs> Um, and, and, and so th this mismatch and this erratic um, extrusion of dopamine and, and serotonin or, or depletion or not enough of them, it makes them more emotional and way more sensitive to stress. So it's just not crazy. It is neurochemical that, that you see all of this behavior that as an adult, you just go, oh my goodness, when is this going to end? Um, Adolescents have advanced cognitive development and maturity. When they have advanced cognitive development and maturity, they can resolve identity issues more easily than peers who are less cognitively developed. And we see that. I've seen that through the years with students who have gone through the summit school. 
They work. Adolescents, you try hard to form who you are, who you want to be. They pull away from parents. The peer group becomes really important. And and I remember um, my grandfather used to say, you know, it's amazing how stupid I am. I was as a parent. Um, but boy, by the time you, your father was 25, I got to be pretty smart. So um, kids just think their parents are dumb and, and, and they look to their peer group for what is right and what is, and what is doable, and what is fun, et cetera. Nevertheless, those family, family values and, and those parent connections still play a very strong part. So here's one of my favorite slides. This is the, the brain in development. So right here at the top of the slide, this is where the frontal lobe is. Everything that's green should be blue. And every silly mistake or immature thing or lack of planning um, is because this is green. And so we look here, this is like adolescence right here. You're starting to get that frontal lobe. And this is between 17 and 20. You see that, that um, change in, in neural structure. So um, sometimes the things that schools ask children to do are not within their neural development. For typically developing children, yes, and sometimes things are even too advanced for them, but for children who struggle with executive function, whose neural development is still here, you put them in middle school expectations and it is a recipe for disaster. And it's interesting that the sex hormones can help drive these kinds of changes in neural development. I find that really interesting. And what's really funny, funny, haha, -ha, funny, funny, interesting, is that testosterone, of course, plays a prominent role in stimulating sex drive, but estrogen, the female hormone, plays some, a role in, in learning and memory. Go figure. I find that extremely interesting. So the hormones, increase in hormones refle ref is reflected in increased cognitive capacity. Um, and, and this is also, I'm just gonna walk you through it quickly. So the sex hormones, he hormones help stimulate the growth of axons and axons are the way in which the brain transmits information from nerve to nerve. Um, and so with adolescents, axons sprout new connections. And it's when you have multiple connections that you can think in a more complex way. Um, and is these the estrogen and testosterone help stimulate and shape the production of white matter, which which covers um, and myelinates the nerves, and it, and it is this progression in, in nerve development that enables lots of um, neural transmissions and faster transmissions to happen so that you can start to multi multitask and think in complex ways and think about the possi possibilities simultaneously. It's just fascinating. So, so it's not willful. It's all about neurochemical. And the hormone-driven increase in white matter is particularly important in helping the brain mature because it drives the flow of information. Very interesting stuff. Growth spurt, feet, we know that. Increased appetite, um, you'll notice, especially with boys, I think. I, I don't mean, mean to stereotype, but um, I think more often with boys and people, you know, you can tell me differently. It's like you can't hold on to your food. Their their appetite just, just increases and it's like they have a hole in the bottom of their foot. Um, and all of a sudden they sprout up. So they get a little chunky, like fifth, sixth grade, seventh grade, and then eighth and ninth grade, and all of a sudden they sprout up and, and, and they slim down. Um, and so that is just very typical. And once again, for kids in fifth, sixth grade, and even seventh grade, if they're still in that chunky lane, um, it promotes more of that self-consciousness and the anxiety about appearance. And then around eighth, ninth grade, they kind of come out of it and, and, and that becomes less of a stressor to them. Um, like I said, um, changes in cognitive development, more independent, better problem solving. Um, their school focus becomes less place-centered and more towards academics. Um, they seek advice from peers and media. Like I said, your IQ dips. By the time a child gets to sixth grade, you're no longer smart. And, and probably you won't regain those IQ points till they're maybe 17, 18, but probably 25 a lot of times. Um, they develop social conscience and they take on more responsibility at home. So this is a, a lot to read, but I wanted to call your attention to 21st century skills. So no longer do we want kids to memorize and spit back what they memorize. We want them to understand information. We want them to be able to find information. We want them to be able to communicate. We want them to think and problem solve. We don't want to just have them learn something, spit it back and pass a test. We want them to, to understand here's the information 
And here's the question. How can you use this information to solve this problem? And, and it's, Kids can't just automatically do it when they get to sixth grade. It is a process that happens from kindergarten, first grade, that gets them to middle school. Um, global awareness. We cannot just think locally. We are a global society. Um, and everything, it's important for kids to understand financial literacy, global literacy, because it uh, economic literacy, because it affects everything that happens in society, entrepreneurial skills, and then civic literacy, liter literacy. Who are you? What does it mean to be a citizen in this country? What is a good citizen? What does it mean to be a good citizen? What are your responsibilities? What are your responsibilities? What are the government's responsibilities? And to have kids to be able to think about it, not just spit through, here's what the constitution says, here's what the declaration of independence, there's meaning behind all of that. And that's what we want ki kids to work towards as they grapple through middle school. So they take ownership, more responsibility, they have increased independence, they get more homework, they have to note take, there's more writing, there's more tests, there's more grades, there's more teachers. So while children might have formed relationships with their teachers in elementary school, now they're seven and they might find a favorite teacher or not. And for teachers, quite frankly, in a typical large middle school, those teachers have 150 to 200 kids running through their rooms every day. It's very hard for teachers to form very close relationships with their students. Um, and they have more classrooms to manage, more organizational systems to manage. And then there's the awful lockers and locks. One of the biggest fears of kids going into middle school. Where am I gonna, how am I gonna find my locker? They all look alike and oh my goodness, how am I ever gonna remember my combination? Um, so here's the picture again. Middle school relies heavily on executive function, executive functioning capabilities of the brain. And the more green in the frontal over the brain when the child gets to middle school, the tougher it is for them to manage, to pick up all the pieces, to go from class to class, to understand the different um, organizational requirements from the different teachers, long-term projects, lots of kids, managing different personalities, it is a feat of ball, neural ball juggling. Most kids can do it, but some kids really struggle and they're just not ready. And girls probably get through this easier than boys. So it's all about, you hear me talk about the frontal lobe, that's my favorite part of, part of the brain. And so through high school, kids lean heavily on the regulatory capacity of the parents and teachers. Their teachers are their surrogate frontal lobes. So the parent says, do you have all your papers for your driving test? Can, did you clean your room? Don't you have a test tomorrow? And, and the child says, and this was what my son used to say to me. So this is a direct quote. Hey mom, the plan, because I used to say to him, what's the plan? And he would say to me, the plan mom is, there is no plan. Talk about aggravating. I have a paper, can you help? That's also straight from my son. And plan ahead for my project, why would I wanna do that? All these three are you know, a, a piece out of my life with my son. My daughter, it, not, not at all. Never would these words be uttered from her mouth. This is a lot of slide, but I just want you to, sh I want you to see all of the things that are involved in executive functions. The next slide has all of the explanations and this is not a talk on executive functions, but I just want you to have the language and have some understanding. So when we talk about this, there's metacognitive regulation. So do you start a task? Can you monitor how you're doing as you do work? Can you plan out your work? Can you organize your materials? And oh, by the way, the most important piece, can you remember as you're doing? Can you remember the bits of information you need to do a task? And that's all involved here. And as you think about your child, you can already think about where they're strong and where they might have challenges. Behavioral regulation in middle school, it's tough. So can you inhibit? Can you, can you not be impulsive? Can you not say something that's gonna get you in trouble? Um, and can you monitor yourself? Can you monitor your own um, work, your behavior, what you're doing? and then emotional control. Can you not get upset? If you find yourself getting upset, can you talk yourself off the cliff? Can you be flexible? Can you say, all right, this didn't go my way, but I'm gonna be okay because that's the way it rolls, that's the rule, whatever. So these three um, categories are what you look at when you look at executive functions. Um, you will get this handout so you can see 
what the definitions for executive function, initiating, starting a task, sustaining an activity, holding on, inhibiting something that's not impulsive or something that, that maybe was funny once, but not funny the third time, shifting, being flexible, planning things out, organize your materials, monitor your own actions. Whatever you're doing, are they going to get you to your goal? And then can you manage your emotions? Can you not get upset? Can you regulate? Can you say, oh, I'm getting upset. I need a break. And working memory. How do you hold on to information in your head that's not visual? So all of these. Now, when you have difficulties with executive function, chances are you don't have difficulty with all of them. It's kind of like a menu. Couple are, are problems and, and the others are not. It just depends upon your style. And, 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 and I like to say your challenges are your isms and you, you learn your workarounds. So when we talk about grappling with change, we have social expectations. Kids want to blend in, not stand out. They are very concerned about their outward appearance. They are very self-conscious and self-centered. They care greatly about peer relationships. They are interested in the opposite sex. Um, and they struggle with family relationships and they want privacy. I remember as, as a teenager, you know, I'm going back when dinosaurs ruled the world and we had the, the landlines with the long phone cord. Um, and so if the, if the phone call came in and I was in a room with my family, I wasn't allowed to leave the room to have a private conversation. Talk about cramping my style. But but all I wanted to was like, this, so this conversation is going to go nowhere. So we'll just chat another time. Kids need privacy and need, um, this is in my way, um, they just need to, to separate a little bit. However, that being said, yes, kids need privacy. They need to feel that they, they kind of guide their own ship. But as parents, it doesn't mean that it's hands off. And what this talk is not about, but I know that you're grappling with it, we all are, is social media, phones, internet, TikTok, um, Snapchat, all of those things that kids use um, where they desire privacy. You may say you can't have an account, a TikTok account. Well, guess what? For all intents and purposes, they don't, but they're so smart. They know how to make accounts where you'll never find them. So it's very important that we let kids know that privacy goes so far that you are involved in their life, not to, not to micromanage them, but to make sure to keep them safe. Um, it is a fine line. So um, grappling with change, um, social expectations, and emergence of peer pressure. Kids will test the limits, push for independence. They have mood swings, the emergence of self. They feel conscious about their sexuality and how they choose to express it. Um, Off-color jokes, you thought you were done with bathroom humor when the child is a four, a three, four, five, but guess what? They, they get those off-color jokes. Um, and you might have not have had that talk with them, but let me tell you, kids know a lot. You may think they don't, kids know a lot. Um, so you probably want to start talking to them openly um, sooner rather than later. So at least they get the right information and the information that is grounded in your family values. Um, and, and your kids might feel shy about asking you questions. But if you talk more openly at the level for their cognitive development, you'll find those conversations are easier. Clicks. Clicks begin around age eight and they're rampant in middle school rampant. Um, they're social groups. Um, they form the basis of many concepts, actions, and reasons for preteen or a teen's existence. Um, it defines who a tween is, and it's usually closed and exclusive, and it's what seventh grade teachers and administrators battle every day. Um, they're hard. Um, with boys, it's athletic ability, coolness, macho masculinity, also funny. In our school, the boys strive to be funny because the ones who are funny are the most popular. And girls, it's looks, it's clothes, it's, so, it's socioeconomic class. Um, some groups are more valued than others. And those who don't fit in a group may feel neglected or hostile to those who do and establish a group identity that is counterculture. Counter -culture. Um, when identity focuses around emotional support rather than activity or positive purpose, they tend to be more destructive. So what do I mean by activity? Um, band, sports, 4-H, Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts. Those are all cliques, but those are all positive, 
positive clicks with an activity that guides the work of the click. Um, and that's okay because kids need to have a tribe. They need to have kids that they feel safe with. They need to have kids that they have relationships and things in common with. And it's just as parents, it's, it's helping them find those clicks that are not only socially acceptable, but emotionally healthy. Um, it gives them a sense of belonging, gives them a sense of friendship, and it gives them a sense of shared enjoyment and preferred activities. So this is really important. Some kids are just kid magnets and make friends. They can make friends with a rug. But there are some kids who are a little more awkward and it's, it's a little tougher for them to, to make and maintain friendships. And so for them, it's really important to find something they like that involves other kids so that they can develop a sense of shared enjoyment and shared memories. And upon that, they can build a friendship and start building those conversations. What's a parent to do with clicks? Model appropriate inclusive behaviors. As a parent, when you learn that your daughter is being exclusive and a mean girl, it's terrible or, or when you find that that there's this sublimi subliminal exclusion going on or subliminal bullying that ostensibly doesn't look like it, but when you examine it, it is. So your children will model their behavior from you and, and it's, that's part of your family talk. My mother used to say to me, always be nice and never talk about anybody and never be jealous about anybody. And she used to tell me that from when I was little and I had those conversations with my kids. Um, but, but they remember it, have the conversations, your kids will remember it. Um, provide children with a variety of venues for social involvement, extracurricular activities. I know it's hard now during COVID, it's really hard, but outside activities or some kinds of sports activities that are done with appropriate physical dif distancing is really important and maintain an interest in their life. Um, what kids say that they fear about middle school, combination locks, being late for class, not having friends, which is a biggie, being too different. Nobody wants to be different. Um, not nobody, most kids don't want to be different and tough classes. They know that moving into middle school is going to be harder. For the kids that are easy with school, they're going to need some encouragement, but once they get there, they're going to see they can do it. But for those kids that struggle in school, they know. They know what they struggle with and they just can't even imagine what it's gonna be like in that new situation with all those teachers, with all those kids, with all those classrooms, finding their way around with all that homework. Um, so so that's, that's hard for kids. Um, kids worry about social status that as perceived by peers, they're worried about body image. They're worried that nobody understands them. They're even fearful of not pleasing you. They do want to please you, even though it may seem like they don't. They do. They're, they fear about not measuring up to their own expectations and to the expectations of their peers. And, and they fear that their parents might find out about negative behaviors. I'm telling you, there's nothing wrong with setting the guidelines. This is my what I expect and this is what I don't expect. Having those kids in the, in the guardrail of expected behaviors that are explicitly discussed is really important. Um, and they're hyper vigilant about their concerns about the larger world community. And they might have global fears such as war or violence. And in today's world, the pandemic for some children is just something that they are having a difficult time climbing out of. Um, parents worry about multiple teachers. How, will, that te will their teachers know, those teachers know their child? Um, who do I go to if I have difficulties? Who, who, can, who can be my port in a storm when my child is struggling? Um, and and how, do we, how do we get teachers to respond when they have so many more children? Um, and what you want to do bet is to best avoid directly or indir indirectly letting your child know what your fears are, because you have to be strong and you have to be positive. Um, with cognitive growth, have conversations with your kids. Encourage them to share ideas and thoughts with you, even if it's silly. When it's silly, you look at them and you say, oh, that's really interesting, I never thought of that. Help me understand, instead of saying, are you crazy? Because that's kind of off-putting. Um, encourage them to think independently. Instead of just telling them what to do, you know, you can say, how do you think you should handle this? What do you think your plan could be? So that they start to develop their own sense of, I can think this through. 
have them set goals, challenge them to think about possibilities for the future. Nothing wrong with a goal in middle school or high school about what they're going to do after high school. Nothing wrong. The goal may change, but it teach kids, it teaches kids to understand that goals are something to work for. And if something is worth it, hard work is worth it. Compliment and praise them for well thought out decisions and help them reevaluate poorly made decisions. Um, if your child is an easy peasy student, it's great. But if your child struggles in school, it's important for you to know the child's learning profile. Stay in touch, reach out to the school, get to know the child's teaching team. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Advocate for your child. Don't be afraid to say, you know what? I, I, I think something's going on here. Let's do something. Let's do some testing. Let's figure out why this child is struggling in school and don't take no for an answer. Um, and then talk to your child. You say, you know, you're, it, science is really a strong suit for you, but gee, that, that reading is so hard for you. Let's talk about it. Talk about what are challenges for your child so that they don't think it becomes a family secret and talk about solutions, things. How do you think we can fix this? I'm thinking about we do this. What do you think? Engage your child in the, the broad range of possible solutions to help them understand who they are as a learner and what they can do about it. I'm going to move these because you're going to through these because you're going to have these slides. Um, always, especially for children who are anxious, it's about the knowing. So if you get a sense that your child is really anxious about something, about something before they enter into the unknown, do as much as you can possibly do to take away what's unknown. So if it's a new school, go to the website, bring your child to the school. If there's summer programs, let them go to a summer program, get a map of the school, try to take away that fear of the unknown as much as you can. And you'll be surprised at how much it reduces a lot of the anxiety. Um, with kids with social expectations, get them involved in extracurriculars, um, arrange activities with friends, um, encourage a child to join group conversations. You've been listening to your child learn on the grid. Um, afterwards, when, when you're driving in the car or when it just seems kind of it's casual, gee, I, I, I didn't hear you participating. Why don't, you know, I knew you had opinions. I knew you had some answers. Why, why didn't you jump in and, and see what your child says? Um, practice the skills need for difficult social situations. Um, if you know that that your child, um, it, 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 give them the language. If they've been out out of school for, for a reason that they don't want to share with their friends, give them some language. Um, sometimes you help them. So I, I'll never forget, I'm, I'm sharing a lot of adolescent stories, but this one time I was about 16 and there was this boy, he was, he was a little bit of a jerk. I mean, I, I gotta be honest. And so um, he, he asked me out for that evening. We were doing something at school. He asked me out for that evening. And I just, I didn't quite know how to say no. So I said, you know what? Um, it, it was kind of like some activity at school. Parents were there. So I, wanna, I have to go ask my dad first. So I went over and I said to my, to my father, you know, so-and-so wants to go out tonight. My father just took one look at my face and he knew. And he said, no, I don't think so. I, I, I don't think it's a good idea. You, you need a little advance notice before somebody just takes you out. But I went back to guys and I saw him. My father said no. And it let me off the hook. So sometimes parents can let kids off the hook instead of saying, um, I'm afraid to do it or I don't want to do it, saying, you know, my mother won't let me or I can't or, you know, kind of fits well with middle school. Um, when your child struggles, intervene early. Don't let it go. Um, testing is not something to be afraid of and a label is not something to be afraid of. Reading difficulty, reading disorder, executive function difficulty, math disability, written it's okay because when you have a really good evaluation, you understand what you have to do. It's like if you go to the physician and say, don't feel good, and they just hand you insulin, well, do they know that you have sugar problems? No, but they just hand you insulin. That's not any good. So once you have a label, you know what to do. And it's the same thing with your child. Open up the lines of communication, listen, role play difficult situations you know they might get into, encourage choices in other areas of your child life. Right now, screen time is, is just awful. We try really hard before the pandemic to have a nice balance between screen time, person, so, person to person social, going outside and playing, and that balance is completely off kilter. So now it's really important to try to find choices that are attractive to your child, that don't involve the screen, that don't involve YouTube channels, that don't involve playing video games with people God knows where all over the world. 
um, it, it's really important. Set an example, repeat the message, um, ask for help if your child has a problem. Sometimes friends are going through the same thing or ask a teacher, um, ask a physician. There's always people who can help you go to the next step to help you resolve a problem. And also, um, this is not, you know, explain the difference between good drugs and bad drugs because kids are going to face it at some point. Um, they're going to see jeweling. They're going to see all the stuff that, that you want to protect them from and had protected them from when they were in elementary school. Um, start early. Um, when kids want information, they ask their parents first. I um, mean, when they're teenagers, they go elsewhere. So make sure that they get information from you. Um, start the conversations. Many of us have always said, you know, the car is the best place for having a conversation because you're just sitting there passing the time. Um, it, it, that's good. And, and my personal opinion is if you're in the car, find a radio station that you both like to listen to, because if your child is plugged in to their own phone, to their own station, they have plugged you out. They have just so so to, to kind of keep that interpersonal going, try to avoid situations where your child is just plugged into their own music or their own world. Um, and just create a world, an open environment, communicate your values, listen to your child. Um, sometimes they just want to tell you something. Um, uh, my little four-year-old granddaughter, um, I'm working with her with a speech, um, working with her on early reading because I think she might be struggling. So a few weeks ago, I pushed her a little too much. And, and I said, just a little bit more, Joe. And she looked at me, she says, Glammy, I'm not saying those words anymore. I said, but, but, but Joe, you, you have, you, you're four and, and this is important for you to do this. And she looked at me and she said, stop talking, Glammy. I listened to her because I, I, if I had pushed uh, any, any future times that I wanted to play Grammy games with her wasn't going to work. Listen to your child, um, especially when they tell you something more than once. It's important. Try to be honest, be patient, use everyday opportunities to talk and talk about key topics again and again and again in different ways at different times, non-judgmental. So what should you be doing now? Social activities, keep, keep an eye on technology. It's okay to have monitoring technology. You know, you should know what's going on in those text messages. You should know about TikTok. You should know about, about um, in, in, whatever, whatever they Instagram. are. Instagram. Instagram, thank you, whatever. Um, you should know about all that stuff. You should know what their accounts are. You should see what's going on. Cause you know what, not a, a lot of times not good stuff is going on. Um, set out your expectations, do goal setting, um, make sure you know what movies and TVs and video games your children are engaging in, have conversations about sex. They already know, trust me. Um, talk to them about making choices and help them manage their responsibilities. This time will never come again and you don't want to lose it. And you want to start these kinds of conversations even before middle school, because when they get to middle school, all bets are off. Everybody knows everything and it's off to the races. Right, Nicole? Yep. yep. So and then the only thing I would add to that is be willing to laugh at yourself. Yes. Be willing to laugh at the conversations yep. um, because some of the stuff they come up with is awesome, is great. And I don't remember always if, oh yeah, we said stuff like that when we were kids. The other thing that I think is really super important too, and you guys know this, is be friends with your kids' friends, parents. Know who those parents are. Yes. Um, because that makes it so much easier when something not so nice happens or somebody misunderstands somebody on TikTok or whatever, not that they should have it anyway, but... Um, it's, it's so much easier if you're friends or have some kind of relationship with your kids' friends to then have those conversations. Oh my gosh, I can't believe our, our silly children did this together, right? And then one parent doesn't blame the other and it's just so much easier to talk through that stuff. Yeah. Um, and remind your kid also that it's okay to have one, if you can make it, I say this all the time, you can make it through middle school with one friend. If you have one good friend, you can make it. You don't have to be in the center of it all. Um, and you certainly don't have to be the loner. Just one good friend can get you through middle school. Um, along with find your person 
who's the other adult in the room aside from your parents? Um, who's the other adult in your world, in your kid's world that you're safe with and that your kid feels safe with um, so that they have another adult? And then, and, and that's to me is, is I think something that's really super important as well. That's really great advice, Nicole. We do, we do call Nicole the, the adolescent whisperer <laughs> at, at the summit school. She gets right inside the soul. She, she, she knows what's going on. So keep calm. We're here to help and, and thank you. And I'm going to take this down. So um, thank you. It was a pleasure meeting you on the grid. Um, we're always here. If you have any questions, don't hesitate and, and have a nice night. We'll see you again.